Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you think of data as the new oil, well, you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway, as always, is Andy Leonard. How's it going, Andy? It's going well, Frank. How are you today? I am fantastic. You know what I did yesterday? What'd you do yesterday, Frank? I finished my capstone project report. Woohoo! Right. So if, for those of you who don't know idea what I'm talking about, uh, I've been working through the Microsoft Professional Data Scientist certification, and uh, I've completed my final project for basically the 10th certificate, which will grant me uh, ninja hood or Jedi hood. I'm not sure how that goes. But. <laughs> well, once you get the official certificate, you're going to have to let me know because I'm going to get you a uh, a lab coat and I'm going to have Christy, who does embroidery, my lovely bride. I'm going to have her embroider a data-driven logo on the lab coat. Ooh, I like that. So what's new with you? Oh, goodness. Well, we're recording this on Friday, July 21st. I'm working, of course. I'm writing still on the Bemmel book, book number 12. Uh, book number 11 came out earlier last week. And uh, really excited about that, developing custom tasks in SSIS. I got a Raspberry Pi 3. I actually bought it for myself as an early birthday present. Oh, very cool. Careful, though. Once you go down the IoT path, forever will it dominate your destiny. (laughs) That's perfect. I like that. So (laughs) we've got two Star Wars references already. I know. And what was the other one? So it was a Jedi, a ninja. So I guess that's a generic class of movies, all the old Bruce Lee movies. Kung Fu, Shaw Brothers type stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Which are on Amazon Prime, by the way. No way. Way, way. I've been introducing my kids to the 10 Brothers of Shaolin, the 36 Chambers. Uh, Wu-Tang Clan fans will know exactly what that movie is. And um, <laughs> and the importance of that movie in hip hop history. My older son first was kind of like, I don't get it, and then like now he kind of requests he, he wants to watch kung fu movies. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, got to pass it on. So I got to tell you, I mentioned Twitter. I was on social media. I, I get on social media every now and then. It seems like I'm on for a little while, and then I get busy. And I was on, gosh, a month or two ago. And I saw one of the user groups in North Carolina had a real live data scientist doing a presentation there. And A real the, live unicorn? A real live unicorn. And you know to date, Frank, you know this, right? Everybody yeah. that we've interviewed, we actually knew in some way or we knew somebody who knew them really well. But we've we've had contact with these people. And this is the first time I actually reached out, kind of like a cold call. And I sent, sent this person, his name is Brad. I sent Brad an email, Brad Llewellyn, and I said, hey, we've got this podcast. You're a data scientist. You're obviously interested in, you know, speaking to the community and stuff like that. We do a community podcast on data science. Would you be interested, you know, in signing up and doing a show? And it it wasn't long. I would say within a couple of hours, I got an email back from him. He was super excited to to dive in and be part of that. So uh, Brad is our guest today. We'd like to welcome you, Brad Llewellyn, to Data Driven. Oh, thanks for having me. So by way of introduction, Brad is a data scientist at Valorum in Charlotte, North Carolina. He has an MS in statistics from the University of South Carolina and an MCSE certification in data management and analytics, as well as an MCSA certification in cloud platform. He's currently working on an MCSE certification in cloud platform and infrastructure. At Valorum, Brad's role involves educating clients and colleagues about Microsoft data science offerings, as well as how to fully utilize these offerings to solve business problems. Brad's an active blogger at breaking-bi.blogspot.com. Now, see, I didn't know who you were, but I knew your blog. (laughs) (laughs) And you can connect with him uh, on LinkedIn at uh, linkedin.com slash in slash Brad Llewellyn. Or on Twitter, and I actually had read some of your tweets on Twitter before, too. That cool handle, at BreakingBI. 
That is the coolest uh, BI handle ever uh, at Breaking BI. So welcome, Brad. All right. Thanks, guys. We're honored to have an official data scientist here. And I have to second everything Andy said. That That is a pretty awesome uh, handle. Thanks. Just kind of made it up one day and it, and it stuck. <laughs> Those are the best. So what do you do as a data scientist at your company? So it's actually pretty interesting. I kind of made the role out of out of nothing, as as I'm sure you guys are aware. Data science is kind of the future of where data is going. So it's about how can we ask those harder questions? How can we do more than just put data on a report? So I basically took my BI background and then just started throwing as much statistics into it as I could, and then eventually became Valorum's evangelist who goes around to customers and talks to them about what they're doing and how they could do it better. So you have an advanced degree in statistics, if I remember your bio. Correct. So obviously that's helped. <laughs> I went to a conference here in Charlotte a few months ago, and they had local business leaders there. And I actually got up and, and asked them, what's the most important thing you look for when you're hiring data scientists? And their answer was, one, passion for data, and two, a mathematics degree. So I would easily argue that it's, it's been the most beneficial thing to me so far. Very cool. What drove you to statistics? Bureaucracy, actually. <laughs> okay. So I, being, being a nerd, I grew up wanting to be a video game programmer mm -hmm. uh, until I got to college and actually took a programming course and realized I hate programming. So I was going to lose my scholarships if I didn't change my major to something that I actually took classes in. So I, I literally just looked at my schedule and said, which of these would I like to be my major? So I just chose math. Which group were you presenting at? I don't even know which one specifically you're referring to. I've I've given that talk to probably five or six in the area. Okay. Most likely it was the Charlotte BI group. I uh, did present to them. I'm also in charge of booking their speakers. So m made it real easy to put myself in that slot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. I know they've had this one loser guy from Farmville, Virginia, come down there and speak a few times. <laughs> I do remember booking him, actually. Yeah. What a coincidence. He also lives in Farmville, Andy. <laughs> It was me. Okay, oh, it was me. Oh, okay. It's a great group. I, I really enjoyed going down there. Melissa Coates and the whole crew down there. It's a great group. I actually worked with those guys years ago, and when I moved back to Charlotte, I had the opportunity to reconnect with them. So they're definitely my favorite user group to go to in the area. What was it that you presented on? So that was a talk on Azure Machine Learning. Interesting. Can you uh, share some of what you talk about there? Maybe give us the 50,000-foot view. Azure Machine Learning is the tool that honestly got me into data science. Uh, the, the, my issue with data science was over the past five years, it was, it was so hard. It was so much coding and so much knowledge you needed. And kind of, kind of looking around for tools that make it accessible to people like me who don't want to do hard coding but really want to ask those questions. So it definitely it, it abstracts a lot of the difficulty away and just leaves you with a program that you can basically just ask questions to and it responds with statistical analyses that a regular person can interpret. So when you say ask questions, do you mean like talk to it physically? I wish. There are, there are some, some cognitive services APIs that can do that. But no, it's much more about instead of uh, having to pick from 10,000 regression models, it has four. And it says, hey, you want to do regression? Here's four regression models. Just pick one. Interesting. It also looks more like Visio than than anything else, I would say. One of the biggest selling features I see when I go around and talk to people about it is the fact that a beginner can open it up and you don't have to code anything. That's a powerful interface then if it's that easy to learn or that easy to get started with. Absolutely. I've, I've had nothing but great reception everywhere I've gone and showed it. So it is, it's definitely part of the future. So what's the downside? What's the catch? Another thing that's not the catch is it's free. <laughs> so... Virtually anybody can go out there and use it. Uh, the only the only downside it has is it doesn't do everything. It do, It's not R or SAS that has those 10,000 regression models. It only has a few. Right. So if you can solve your problem using those basic models, absolutely do it. It'll save you 50% of your time easily. Where What it doesn't do is ask those really hard questions. It's not really designed for that. Oh, so the other critique of uh, Azure ML Studio is you, it's a bit of a black box. You don't really know exactly what's going on under, under the hood. Certainly for some aspects, that's true. I mean, uh, I could, 
I could see where, where people come from in that. Uh, honestly, I see it the same way I see any other program. I'm telling you to do a linear regression and I'm giving you these parameters. At, at the end of the day, R is a black box too from that aspect. Right. I think it, it's uh, people who make those criticisms tend to be people who are very well versed in existing machine learning packages like scikit-learn or that sort of thing. So it's a valid point, but there is just a hint of snobbery. <laughs> I certainly understand that. And I, and I try to not have that on my side. <laughs> but for me, I mean, just kind of seeing the way if you put some models together inside ML Studio and then you start learning scikit-learn, it's a lot easier to go from four or five models to, you know, the thousand or hundred. It's easier to go in that direction because you can be like, oh, okay, I know this. Or you kind of run the same type of regression analysis, but you do it in code versus kind of drag and drop. And for me, it helped me learn, helped me get hooked. I couldn't agree with that more. The way I generally pitch it to people is most enterprises aren't going to solve every problem they have with it, but it's really good for easy, fast problems and for people to learn. That's really where I find its niche. Well, that was going to be my next question. How useful is this in production enterprise problems and identifying trends and uh, correlations and root causes? That's honestly where I think it really shines. I go around from time to time and do actual Azure ML engagements with people. And I found that I can generally do an entire ETL process, an entire model building process, and productionalize that model in a week or two versus if I had to do that using R or Python, it would take me a month just because it integrates so nicely into everything and it runs so quickly that if you can solve it using, using Azure Machine Learning, I highly recommend that that be the first stop. Right. Actually, for the Capstone project I was talking about, I actually did some of the data munging inside ML Studio and it was just easier to do. Not everyone is an SSIS expert, Andy. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm looking for one too. I, I don't consider myself an expert. Experienced? Yes. Not an expert. <laughs> What's some neat stuff you've been doing most recently? So most of what I've been doing recently is just going around and talking to people. So I give a lot of community presentations, both about Azure machine learning and data science in general. And a lot of what I do is just talking to junior people or college grads or honestly industry professionals who are trying to transition into data and kind of help them bridge that gap between where they currently are and how to get to data science. And that's why we're really glad to have you on this podcast because that's our people. <laughs> Awesome. A couple of questions. One is, what's the reaction that you get from people? Like, what's holding them back in your opinion? Before I talk to them, it's, it's almost always a perception that, honestly, data science is only for super nerds. You know, you got to have advanced degrees and you have to know 12 different programming languages because 20 years ago, that, that, that was the case. I try to go out and show them, you don't need all of that. There are tools out there, not just Azure Machine Learning, other tools too, that remove a lot of that difficulty and just bring it down to giving you a good starting point where a business professional or a non-data science IT professional can, can go in and really start to learn and then expand their knowledge base from there. What do you see the future of data science? It seems two parts to me. It seems... The big data part, which is going to be a major portion of it, what, what we have as BI today is a lot of just moving data around. In 10 years, that's still going to be the case, except it's not going to be SQL anymore. It's going to be big data. You're going to have JSON formats or whatever comes after JSON. And being able to move that through all the big data tools is going to be a huge part of that. And Internet of Things is, is huge in that area. Also, having data science tools that allow the computer to do what the computer is good at. Meaning to get off the Microsoft train, there's another cool tool out there called H2O's Driverless AI, which basically you throw at a data set and it builds models almost by itself for you. Letting the computer just decide, hey, you want to predict this, I'll pick the best model for you and then throws things back out. That's another really cool area of the space. There was some buzz on Twitter the other day about uh, how the data scientists will be automated away by 2025, which I can see that happening to a degree. And maybe not by 2025. What are your thoughts on that? That seems like an aggressive estimate. I look at the modern, I call them data analysts. Data scientist is a bit of a broad term, so I don't, I don't like to use it as a catch-all. The statistician, as you will, who goes out and builds these models. Every day they just build new models, they interpret models, present those to stakeholders, customers, whoever. A lot of what they're doing is similar to what Excel analysts were doing 10 or 15 years ago. It's a lot of manual work. Now we have BI that takes a lot of that 
Excel work off the plate. So they've had to transition into not munging the data themselves, but telling computers how to do it. And I think the same thing is going to happen to what's currently being called a data scientist. They'll transition out of building the models themselves into how do we get, how do we give the computer the data it needs to make the best decisions possible. Interesting. There's a startup I've been working with on providing evangelism services to that's actually based in France called Predixis.ai. And they have a it's not quite fully automated, but it definitely makes making predictive models a little more approachable. You feed it data and it actually will discard the items or the fields that are not really relevant to the result. And it'll actually rank them in terms of the order. So you can really get a feel for the data. It's definitely in some ways, I think, easier and more approachable than even Azure ML Studio. There's another non-Microsoft product out there. Uh, I don't know if anybody's used the, the Amazon machine learning interface. I have, yeah. It's basically a simplified version where you give it a data set and you tell it a field to predict and it just builds your model for you. It doesn't even ask any more questions. So if you're definitely just really getting started or have a really quick question, then that's another one of the tools that I think is is going to go places. Right. I, I would actually say uh, AWS ML is a bit underdeveloped right now. I mean, it is easy, but you don't really have a lot of choice of algorithms. You have the choice of one algorithm. Stochiastic gradient descent, I think is it. Mm-hmm. Which is still very useful. I mean, you can still create a predictive model. And it, you're right. You mean, you just give it data. It tells you a prediction. And you can kind of go from there, which is a great place to start. And it's relatively simple to kind of learn. Mm-hmm. But one question I have is I, I've had this problem where I'll talk to the business decision makers. And they kind of scratch their chin. And they, and they think, you know, maybe we'll do something with this data. I mean, I would say we're definitely kind of on the early end of the curve, but but have you encountered that where the business decision makers think this is way too advanced? And that comes from a couple different places I've seen. One, there there are the business executives that prescribe to what I'm calling the old way, which is that it's just really hard to do and that it's hard to train people. It's hard to hire people. And my response to them is there are new tools out there that make that a lot easier. And secondly, there are those that don't trust black boxes. They say, well, I really want to be able to know why the machine thinks we should do this. And my response to them is, why is the why important to you? So the, the, the example I always give them is, I use a computer all day, every day. I don't know exactly what happens inside the computer. I press A on the keyboard and A pops up on my screen. And I trust that because every time I click A, A comes up on the screen. I don't need to know why. All I need to know is that it works. There's actually little trolls that take the message from the keyboard. (laughs) I always suspect it. (laughs) Yeah. And a hamster wheel is actually running the whole thing on power. (laughs) I used to play a really old game when I was a kid called The Incredible Machine, which Mm -hmm. was uh, you, you basically built these really obscure contraptions out of like punching bags and automated hammers and things like that that would like get balls from one end of the screen to the other. And I've always suspected that's what happens when you flip a light switch. It's a <laughs> spring-loaded hammer that hits a switch that then moves a ball. And <laughs> That's awesome. Another question for you. Um, how did you get into this, Brad? Did, did you find your way into data or did data find you? When I got out of school, as, as a lot of people my age, I'm a young guy, had trouble finding a job, even in statistics. So I actually uh, met a guy here local to Charlotte who was willing to give me a SQL consulting job, even though I had no SQL experience. So I just kind of fell into that. And I took that job because I had no other options and then just fell in love with SQL at that point and kind of extended SQL with my current statistical knowledge and kind of happened to be where data science popped up. Interesting. Does it drive you crazy as a officially trained statistician when you hear like, you know, news reports saying, you know, polls say this or scientists have released this. Are you like, what's the P value? What's the P value? I've actually changed quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, Mainly just a lot of interaction with, with business users who aren't statisticians. I I used to be like that, but now I'm much more about what value does it have? I, I don't generally concern myself with, you know, P values and F1 scores and things like that. I'm much more about, does it work? How often does it work and what can I do with it? Right, right. Sounds like you've become more pragmatic. Yeah, definitely. And for those of you that are probably thinking that we're making these terms up, uh, these are actual statistical terms. (laughs) Yeah, We'll include links to the uh, Wikipedia articles in the show notes. We can do that. You know, it sounds like a lot of good consulting experience came out of that, uh, that opportunity as well. Oh, definitely. 
I won't name him here, but uh, he's he's still a good friend of mine, and I still invite him to barbecues and everything because I honestly tell people he he's the one who got me to where I am today because the data side of it was something that schools didn't teach at the time, and they're just now starting to teach. So it was it was hugely important. Well, that's very cool. Look, if you want to say his name, it's okay with us. Okay. Well, he works for a consulting firm here called Mariner, and his name is Peter Dara. Okay. He's a really good friend of mine. Well, I know Mariner. I've had some friends that worked there in the past, and I believe Wayne still works there. He does. He's uh, he's their big shot. He's yes. He knows everything. <laughs> Wayne's a big shot in the technical community too, in SQL Server community. He he was a former president of PASS and wow. a uh, very uh, very community oriented person, and I have a lot of admiration and respect for him. One of the one of the things that was interesting about Wayne is uh, when I worked at Mariner, uh, that was back in back before data science was what it is today. I mean, there was like analysis services, data mining, which was not just not ready. Uh, but he and I actually worked on a way to integrate integration services with R to help one of their customers predict when customers' electrical boxes were going to fail. So we were able to build that using R and integration services. And that was 90% Wayne just being awesome. Wow. Wow. So uh, you both must be excited that with R's integration into SQL Server now. Oh, definitely. I mean, I've had I've had people come up to me, and it makes my job a lot easier because I, I work for a Microsoft consultancy. When, when they come up and say, well, Azure Machine Learning is great, but it, it doesn't do this. My response is R does, Python does, and both of those integrate naturally into SQL Server. What's your favorite part of your current gig? I love the evangelism part. I mean, honestly, I love going out and talking to people about what are you currently doing and here's how you can make it better with data science. I and mean, that's that's what I love about my job. How receptive are people? Do they have kind of that, that Blues Brothers uh, scene in the church where they say, I've seen the light after you talk to them? So it depends. Uh, there, are, there are definitely some people who aren't ready. I mean, they're, they're still holding on to old paradigms and and for those guys i'm just like hey we'll come back in a few years and and see what you think but most of the people are seeing that you know data science is is the new thing everybody's talking about it so almost almost anybody in the data space you go up to and talk to is gonna really be hungry to learn more about data science especially if it's easy enough for them to use that makes sense and andy yes sir that's three movie references so far i see that yeah we we had a bit of a dry spell for a while. We did. We're bringing up the average and maybe even the median. I don't know. Ah. <laughs> Another statistic joke, right? Where's your sound effects, Frank? Oh, yeah. Another statistic. We'll have to edit that so that's shorter. There we go. <laughs> and that's actually the first time we've used that. We're setting all kinds of records here with you today, Brad. Thanks for being on. Oh, you guys are you guys are awesome. Thanks for having me. And no problem. This is what happens when you have a unicorn. Magical things happen. <laughs> I have a complete this sentence for you, Brad. Sure. When I'm not working, I enjoy blank. Video games. Yeah. With uh, with all capital letters. Okay. I'm married, and my wife, uh, when we were dating, was like, you know, one of these days you're probably not going to be able to play video game for hours every day. And I'm like, watch me. <laughs> still doing it in all my free time i'm just i was i was raised on video games and, and it's it's part of who i am nice so what's your uh game of choice these days oh i'm a big rpg fan i'm a nerd like that so so i love all the final fantasy games or, or anything like that oh very cool here's another question for controversy pc or console <laughs> I, I'm not a, you know, strict either way. I mean, they, they certainly have their, uh, strengths, but console is nice for just sitting around and doing something. Cause you get to sit in recliners and, and do whatever. That's true. If I'm going to play a game that requires me to actually do something, I'm the mouse is, is just unbeatable. Right. That makes sense. Frank, you are always stirring the pot. I'm telling you, man, you know, that's how you get ahead in today's media. You just got to stir controversy. I'm going to have to ask the other question. You haven't stirred the pot with this question yet. Python or R, Brad? <laughs> I've I've never actually used Python, interestingly enough. I've used R for years because that's what they taught when I went to school. And and I don't even know if Python was around in what, 2010 or whatever. All right. Before we get hate mail from all the Python people, Python started around 1991. Okay. Well, I was not aware of that. <laughs> 
but I watched a Python presentation a few months ago. And as, as the presenter was talking, I was like, this looks really similar to R. It may, may just be the basic concepts, uh, but I, I didn't notice a huge difference from the five minute introduction I got to it, which is certainly not enough. Right. And a lot of that is the, the language certainly is a different feel to it. But a lot of the libraries are typically, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail on this, but a lot of the libraries tend to be written in R first and then ported over to Python, which is why if you look at the code and they're doing kind of the same things, you get the data, you shape the data, you fit the model, and then you output the results. That's why a lot of it looks similar. Mm -hmm. Well, they're trying to solve the same problem. Right. I mean, how many ways are there to solve the same problem? Sometimes there's a lot, but, you know, for the most part, if things have typically explored and researched in R and then ported to Python. Yeah, that makes sense. Brad, one more fill in the blank. I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. I've had this conversation a ton of times because I have a bunch of geek friends, too. Honestly, it's it's a tie for me. It's one, self-driving cars, because they're just awesome. But two, I really think probably the coolest tech that people don't talk about enough is all of these automatic medical screening technologies. Look at your smartphone and it tells you if you have cancer. And I'm like, that that legitimately saves lives. Yeah. That's, that's some of the most impressive tech out there. So did you see the video that was going around? I don't know. It's probably earlier, early 2017, where the guy trapped the self-driving car. I did, I did not. Okay, so I, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it's only about two and a half, three minutes long. And it's running at kind of super fast speed. But what he does is he spray paints dash lines in a large circle big enough to hold a self-driving car. And then inside the line, he spray paints a solid line. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the car drives into it. Of course, it can't cross the solid line, so now it's trapped. <laughs> Why do I think that graffiti artists in the near future are going to have a field day with that? I thought it was pretty cool. I was kind of blown away by it. To me, it had engineer written all over it. <laughs> I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. For me, it's about getting to the point where I can personally use technology to actually make a difference in something. I'm getting to that age where I'm finally looking at what impact I'm having on the world around me. Definitely trying to figure out what can I use my skill set for that can, you know, genuinely help people and, and make the world a better place. This is the part of the show where we ask you to share something different about yourself, a hobby, something you like to do, maybe a former career. But we do ask you to remember that we have our clean lyrics rating on iTunes and we'd like to keep it. I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough in my life to be a pretty, pretty vanilla person most of the time. Vanilla as in plain, right? Not like vanilla ice. No. <laughs> I wish, but no. Uh, so I go around, you know, tr travel around the Southeast giving talks and to customers and presentations and everything. You'd never think that I'm probably the shyest person you've met. My wife takes me to a party and I stand in the corner and don't talk to anybody. <laughs> Unless you find out they're also a data scientist. If somebody wants to come up and talk about data science, I'm all talking all day, but they come up and talk about the weather and I'm just mouth shut. <laughs> But why is it when you put a bunch of geeks in a room, they gather in a corner? Maybe the Wi-Fi signal's better over there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Where's a good place for people to connect with what you're doing? Obviously, there's Breaking BI, and I always I have that theme song in my head now. But where's a good place to uh, connect with you? I have my Twitter that we talked about before, so you can find me at Breaking BI. Mainly what I do is I just go around and, and give talks and go to talks a lot in the in the Charlotte area or even around the southeast. So so if you live around there, we can definitely connect at a user group or something. Otherwise, my blog or LinkedIn is about the only place you're going to find me on the Internet. And any parting words of advice to would be data scientists or people that are kind of on the fence about, you know, can I do this? I'm a, I'm a data person. Can I do this? I'm a software engineer. Can I do this? Any parting words of advice? The only thing I say to those people is you certainly can. And all it takes is a couple hours a week of reading a few good books and, and you're there. Just train as much as you can and, and you'll be there in no time. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Brad, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. 
Sign up today at datadriven.tv. Today's episode of Data Driven was brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at thedatadrivenbook.com. You know, on Data Driven, we talk a lot about data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But did you know the hardest part of any data science-related project is data integration? Data scientists often call data integration, data wrangling, or the icky word, munging. But it's all about making sure the analytics engine that you're using has valid and clean data. Enterprise Data and Analytics specializes in data integration and can help your enterprise build better data integration solutions faster with best practices and automation. Enterprise Data and Analytics offers training and consulting services for SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, and Business Intelligence Markup Language, or BIML. Visit entdna.com to learn more. Enterprise Data and Analytics. Data. It's in their DNA.